Hello folks, Phil Gallagher of Thraben You here for another Legacy stream. Today we're doing a donation deck list from Lucas B, um, who is a frequent YouTube viewer, and he submitted a pretty cool deck list that I did some tweaking to. So the original idea was a blue-green Dino Stompy deck that splashed for, I believe, Oko, Brazen Borrower, and Hull Breacher in the main deck. And when he sent me the donation, he said, hey, feel free to mess with this however you want. And... <laughs> Welcome, Dino Cat. And I, I did some tinkering. Spies, thank you very much for your support. Very much appreciated. So, yesterday, in the red-green stacks video, we played with a mana base that was relatively similar to this one, and we realized that we were tripping over our mana quite a bit. And in sitting down to play this deck list today, I realized, you know, if we're running Brazen Borrower, which has a blue-blue cost on it in the main deck, that's probably going to be pretty hard to cast. The front end is fine, and having that bounce as interaction is really cool, but I thought it was going to be not impossible, but difficult to cast that anywhere close to on curve. And so I ended up cutting the Brazen Borrowers. And then as I started thinking about Legacy right now, I asked myself, like, how good is Hull Breacher actually in the main deck if you're not doing something unfair with it? And I settled on the fact that, like, Hull Breacher might not actually be as good as just something else that gets the opponent dead. And so I, I messed with the numbers of Hull Breachers, and I settled on one in the sideboard, because I still want to have access to that card. Like, the card is sweet if played off an Ancient Tomb. Like, that's disgustingly good. But I wasn't sure that consistently casting it is, like, a realistic win condition in game one for a Stompy deck. And I decided to put in Mana Gorger Hydras instead. And Mana Gorger Hydra is a threat that will slowly spiral out of control. Well, and not super slowly, like if your opponent casts two or three cantrips in one turn trying to dig for an answer to it and they miss, like, oh buddy, we are doing some disgusting trampoly damage. And then we have a lot of the other, like, fan favorite Dino Stompy cards, like of course the namesake card, Shifting Ceratops. Uh, Re Reaple Chief, you got, you got to one of my next points. So here's the thing about this deck. Oko is something that requires both a green and a blue mana, and there are ways to obtain both of those things simultaneously in one land, such as Interplanar Beacon or the green-blue filter land. However, some of those things don't necessarily work well with casting the other colored spells in the deck, and hence that's why I ultimately am not going too deep in any one direction. You can play all sorts of, like, gross, disgusting Planeswalkers if you want in your colorless shell if you're playing a bunch of uh, interplanar beacons to support them. But if you're trying to do that and also cast double-colored spells, um, you're probably going to have a bad time. We have a decent number of two-mana plays, but this deck is really a three-mana plays is what matters sort of deck. And to help us out against the blue decks in the sideboard, I've added my favorite legacy sideboard card, Carpet of Flowers. That should do an incredible amount of work for helping with matchups like Delver, where soft permission is going to matter, or help us just get out a little bit ahead in other matchups. Otherwise, we have a relatively strong pile of additional hate for combo decks, and a few things to help us out in the fair matchups. Questing Beast, because we're the only one allowed to have fun with an Oko, and Garuk Relentless, because these decks tend to be hurting for removal spells, and that's why the donor originally wanted a Brazen Borrow in here, was to have more creature interaction. Um, I think that's more or less what I have to say about this, so let's go ahead and jump into a league. YouTube folks, if you would take a minute and like and perhaps subscribe if you're normally watching the content, I would appreciate it. I'm working towards 3,000 followers, and I'm hoping to get there soon. Okay, uh, we can have a turn one Chalice of the Void, so I think I will go ahead and keep this hand. And, uh, we'll see where we go. It's possible that I should slow roll this hand and not go for Chalice on one, 
because I can play Chalice on one followed by Oko or Trinisphere the following turn. But Chalice of the Void has the highest impact when played on turn one and the highest chance of resolving when played on turn one. So I think I'm going to go ahead and go for that. All right, it has just snapped re resolved. All right, Chalice versus Polluted Delta. I like where we're at. This is a little tricky. I theoretically want green green for shifting Ceratops, but just like... I'm going to cast this Oko next turn, like, basically, no matter what. Let's just get a forest. If we're about to play a Scavenging Ooze. Oh, SCK, I, I absolutely love Shifting Ceratops. Like, I love that card enough that, like, I played it in the Legacy Premier League. So, like, that's, that's dedication. It's very possible that I'm just supposed to play the Trinisphere this turn since my opponent hasn't made a move yet. But I don't really want to play Trinisphere and then get Wastelanded off of Tropical Island. That would be quite awkward. I have raised my concern, and now I will play Trinosphere. Bruce Saint, thank you very much for following. Oh, we're just done. All right, now, this is a very important skill. When you look at the name ShamWow Fella, what sort of deck would you imagine they play? T-E-S. I'm really getting a, like, Bryant Cook, like, polishing a car, wax on, wax off, Mr. Miyagi sort of vibe here. Hmm. Reanimator. That's very possible. Let's see what MTG Goldfish has to say, but I think I'm going to be sideboarding for combo. Sham wow fella. Last legacy results were quite a while ago with a four color mid range deck. They didn't fetch, so we don't even know whether or not they have like non basics or not. This is definitely going to be a game where sideboarding wrong could be incredibly costly. So, like, if they're playing some sort of Snoko deck, we probably want to drop most of this crap and just board in as many threats as we can. And if they are playing a combo deck, we want to sideboard vastly different from that. I think what I'm going to do is try to make some adjustments that are reasonable and sort of hedge in both directions without hurting either primary plan. So I'm going to swap Tarmogoyf for Hole Breacher. And... Let's maybe drop two threats for Carpet of Flowers. I feel comfortable doing that.
The Carpet of Flowers will be okay in either case. Like, obviously, it will be much better if our opponent is playing a slow controlling deck where they put two or three islands into play and I get a good amount of acceleration. Sounds great. I love it. Yep, yeah, Strife of Pile is totally a reasonable guess. The Bloodstained Mire is a little bit less indicative of something like snow. Well, <clears throat> so we have some choices this turn. If I play Chalice on 1 off of Ancient Tomb, I don't actually have the capability of playing that Carpet of Flowers ever. I can first main phase Exile, Elvish Spirit Guide, play Carpet of Flowers, second main phase Ancient Tomb 3-Ball. That might be my best line, that like... Or alternatively, like, I could put the Chalice into play as well. No, Wiz. Like, I was thinking about that line, too. It just involves using the Elvish Spirit Guide. Oh, that just snap resolved. Alright, then I'm dropping Trinosphere. Snap off the Trinosphere. So fast. I think we're uh, going to take down this game exceptionally quickly. Put a threat into play this turn? i probably put a threat into play this turn and then follow up with Chalice the following turn. Hyperlink, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, I got a lot of very positive feedback about that video. Got a couple of Reddit awards, for example. Um, which is not something that is super typical for people who are posting videos. This could be something like a Burning Wish here. Could be playing against TES. Yep, alright. Wish Claw Talisman. I'm going to stick a second Trinosphere, I think. That way my opponent has to, like, basically pulverize. 
or they're not getting anywhere close to an acceptable position. So by playing out the second Trinisphere, it means that a single Decay or Bounce spell isn't going to leave me in a bad position. Yeah, playing Trinisphere on one into Threat on two was really strong. Ad nauseums and equivalent are not going to be super viable as a way to go off. We probably end up taking this game. <laughs> I mean, honesty, Jones, that, that sort of thing happens where sometimes, like, you just queue into the wrong matches and and you can't win and like that's okay it it happens but if you had gotten paired against fair blue and then like you had all the time to dirt a lot around and draw cards uh, it's an entirely different story but like don't keep pushing on if the leagues aren't fun for you i think that's very very important like if you're uh very tired of going and dealing with like Oko round after round after round and you need to take a break from Legacy, like feel free to do that. Uh, YouTube folks, I think my opponent is effectively conceding here and they're just gonna like wait five minutes to time out because they're salty. So I'm gonna stop the recording here. My opponent is back. I think we're about to take down this game. Overall, I would say well. So this represents lethal damage next turn. All right, and now we have to like try to cast Chalice of the Void through Trinosphere, which is a major pain in the ass. All right. I've spent at least three mana. Adjust. I may change the value of X. The value of X is one. Okay. Value of X is one. Okay. Cancel. Alice of the Void. Two. Adjust. Value of X is one. Okay. Mana. Value of X is one. Done. Jesus. Possible this should have just gone on zero, by the way. The templating has gotten so bad that if you don't know how to cast Chalice of the Void because you're not regularly playing with it, it is a pain in the ass. They changed it a couple months ago. And, like, since I'm only playing Chalice decks on occasion, I always forget how it actually works. I have to stumble through that every time. Okay, and our opponent has conceded the game here. Uh, unless they had something like Pulverize, they couldn't do anything this turn. 
And even if they did pulverize, they probably could not go off and they had lethal damage. Yeah, bad place for them. Our round two opening hand is way too mana heavy, so we're going to go ahead and mulligan that. And this hand is totally fine. I will be keeping this. I think I'll... Am I in the play? I am on the play. I think I'm going to pitch the... Re Hmm. I'll pitch this land. I am a deck that could potentially Chalice on 1 followed by Chalice on 2 without it disrupting too much of my plan. And so keeping the second Chalice... Ooh, my opponent has Mulligan to 5. Uh, keeping the second Chalice so that if the first one doesn't resolve, I have a second. Or that so the second can be a one two punch that cuts off most of my opponent's castable spells seems strong. Please don't be oops and punish me for not playing a chalice on zero this turn. <laughs> that would be disappointing. Oh, my opponent just didn't play anything. That's interesting. I play Tropical Island. That should probably con sufficiently confuse them. I expect that what my opponent is going to do is take one more draw step and then concede. That's the feeling that I have. So I'm going to try not to show them my win condition and try to confuse them as much as possible. And now my opponent either needs to show me a card when they discard or they need to concede before they see what I'm winning with. And uh, since green-blue Chalice of the Void pile is not really a thing, that's a real choice for my opponent. Oh shit, they are on Dredge. Uh, I've been punished for not playing a Chalice on Zero. Quite punished. <clears throat> and my hand isn't particularly good at beating Dredge. So that gets them to exactly seven cards in graveyards, so they, they can they can activate Cephalid Coliseum. They are all in on this little stinkweed imp right here. Uh they hit exceptionally well. Holy shit. Oh my god. We're dead. So that's multiple bridge from belows plus cabal therapy. Which, it doesn't matter, because the Cabal Therapy portion of it isn't going to resolve. But the Bridge from Below portion still works. So there's another Cabal Therapy in here. That means they convert a Narc Amoeba into three more zombies. And I'm basically just facing down lethal damage in a single turn. Like, holy crap, did we get punished for not having a Chalice on zero. Marja, the big stupid dinosaurs turned sideways in one last round. I think the thorns and trinospheres and chalices are all reasonable on the play. They get considerably worse on the draw, but it's not exactly like I have a great pile of things to bring in. I think... I might play Questing Beast just as something that 
uh, is harder to block because it's going to get through like pretty much anything. So I'm going to treat this as an unblockable creature. And I think we can win the game with things that cost less than shifting Ceratops. Having access to Scavenging Ooze in addition to Leyline of the Void is pretty hot. Slumbo, thank you very much for your support. Oko is medium minus here. A bunch of my creatures are medium minus, though. Maybe Oko being difficult to cast is the deal breaker. One library? Maybe one library. I don't know that I want to drop much below 17 threats. And then on the draw, I'll keep a few more threats and probably not play some of these colorless cards, although I'm not sure which ones yet. Nope. Chalice is not good enough to keep as the only thing that's in the hand. Um, this hand is fine. Although it's quite bad if my opponent ends up mulliganing to something that beats Leyline, which is probably what they should be doing if I'm playing a Stompy deck. Like, historically, the hate of choice for those is Leyline. Let's see if we have enough... Uh something to win this game. My opponent just makes a few land drops without actually answering my ley line, and I can... Oh, god, that's so good. Kind of. No, I, I think it's going to fall into the category of so good. I'll go ahead and play that. Uh, it's awkward because I can't 3-ball next turn, and 3-ball is gross. God damn it. Alright. Uh, if my opponent can go ham this turn and dump things into their graveyard, they probably win. If they can't put stuff into their graveyard this turn and I get the Trinosphere down, um, life's bad for them. Alright, so they have named themselves and put a Grave Troll into the graveyard. Uh, yeah, this falls under the category of bad for me, and I can't put Trinisphere into play this turn. I can do that next turn, but it's kind of too late at that point. I expect to lose this game at this point. The tracker will be nice. The tracker can get clues, which can help us get towards Scavenging Ooze. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, they only hit a thug. But they probably just therapy themselves for Grave Troll again here. Yep, that is exactly what's happening. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Let's go ahead and eat the Golgari Grave Troll. And then let's go ahead and eat the Golgari Thug. And now we've probably weathered the storm and come out okay. Like, thank you, Scavenging Ooze. <laughs> that was beyond timely. My opponent does have seven cards in Graveyard, so they can activate Cephalid Coliseum and discard the Golgari Thug. Nice. 
very happy to get the win in that game. <laughs> okay, so now on the draw, our Trinospheres and Thorn of Amethysts lose a decent amount of punch. So I think I'm going to go ahead and ditch Thorns and pick up the Sylvan Library to help us find Scavenging Ooze, and then... Do I play the Hull Breacher? The Hull Breacher has text versus things like Faithless Looting, um, Careful Study, but a lot of times those things are going to hit the graveyard before Hull Breacher would be in play. Whatever the last card I play here is, it's not going to be good. Tarmogoyf will be huge. Do I want a big boy or a fish boy? I'll take the fish boy. But I don't actually know if that's right. So this is a turn one Trinosphere. The worst card here is maybe Prismatic Vista. A fetch land is nice if Tracker hits play, but like I need the first three land drops in order to get this, and unless I draw a soul land, I'm not accelerating it out earlier. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bend that. All right, my opponent has Mulligan to four, and that starts to get to be the point where it's hard to have, like, answer plus land plus dredger plus thing to put them into the graveyard. My opponent has Mulligan to two. Uh, they're probably dead. All right, so did you mulligan into answer to Leyline? Maybe not. We'll put this on one because it stops both that bounce spell and things that can potentially put dredgers into the graveyard. Yeah, that's fine. We have Trinosphere next turn. And then we'll play Trinosphere into this, followed by this, and that nah, probably gets there most of the time. There's a very careful balance between mulliganing towards cars that beat hate and making sure that you keep a functional hand. All right, and that's the game there. My opponent has uh, understandably packed it in. I don't have enough mana with this opening hand. I'm going to mulligan this. Eh? Um, 
This is probably a keepable six card hand. It doesn't do anything fast, but I don't know that I want to go to five and just risk having a non-functional hand. A strong hand that can lead on like basic into basic into Sylvan Library into potentially a relevant three drop card is probably going to do okay. We also get to like lead on Prismatic Vista and look like we're a blue deck for a turn or two, and that might cause our opponent to do some weird things. Stifle would be a bear here. When you can play a three ball, you do play a three ball. A good generic piece of advice. It's possible that like playing Sylvan Library around a daze is better this turn, but I don't actually really care about this three ball, and so I'm opting to use this as a bait spell. It's awesome if it resolves, and it's also great if it just takes one of my opponent's counter spells, especially if I get a two for one with the force of will or force of negation. Oh, baby. We're playing against Court of Cunning. So we are potentially playing against a Shark Still or maybe Bosch and Roll's Shark Court deck. All right. Crucible has appeared. Five mana. Awkward that this isn't green producing here. Then I could like double eat their lands out of the graveyard. We're just going to always yield to that. And let's see how big my Hydra can become. Oh, yes. <laughs> Make my monster grow. There's probably a good portion of my audience that thinks that's a sexual comment and not a reference to Power Rangers. I'm not in old man territory by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm sure that reference is lost on a good number of people. I always yield to that. I'm not going to say always yes because my opponent could be playing Hall Breacher. Well, this is trash. I don't like this. Am I just getting through it? It could just be getting through it here. <clears throat> I do have fetch lands, though. Let's put this one back, and then let's keep one. So we're doing this pre-combat to A, put a counter on Mana Gorge or Hydra from casting this, and B, if our opponent responds with a counter spell, we get yet another counter on Mana Gorge or Hydra. I 
I somewhat expected to just eat a source of plowshares, but... Oh, a petty theft. Sure. That's annoying. I want to eat this wasteland now. And then since I can't eat both lands, I might as well wait. All right, that's a nuisance. That is probably bouncing my ooze, but could bounce my Sylvan Library. Eh. No, I, I will just eat the land. Possible eating the Ponder is good for things like Snapcaster Mage, but eh. Um, basic swamps, I believe in the business it's what they call perfect deck building. Didn't I just... Didn't I just pay for life for a card? Am I crazy? I thought I just paid four life for that card. Okay, I just misclicked. Alright. That's fine. Like, it's a bad misclick, but... It is what it is. Now I don't double spell this turn. So we respond to that by eating this fetch land so that when my opponent gets priority back, they can't just redeploy it. Their Crucible of Worlds has already given them great value. I don't want them to have any more value beyond just that. There is a world where I just leave that ponder in there. Specifically because of my one of Tarmogoyf. Alright, put that on top. And I will pay the life for this this time. Let's see, no, no creatures in graveyards, unfortunately. And imagine if I had a Mana Gorge or Hydra last turn instead of this turn. Womp womp.
Notably, Shark Typhoon cycling is not casting a spell, right? So, in case anyone was wondering, like, hey, the opponent did a thing and missed Mana Gorger Hydra, didn't get bigger. That's what was up there. Um, Shark Typhoon cycling aspect is very strong. I like these. I like these a lot. I think I'm going to plan on shifting Ceratops with haste next turn. And this will let me know pre-combat whether or not I have Swords to Plowshares to worry about. My opponent taps anything here. I don't have to worry about losing Scavenging Ooze to a second Shark Typhoon, which is something that I'm thinking about right now. <sighs> that happens. As long as they don't have yet another answer... I'm okay here. I give this haste, I answer the Teferi, hopefully I've shut off enough of their spells, I have good filtering via Sylvan Library, and card advantage via the tireless trackers that are on top. But if this Ceratops gets answered, I am in trouble. Big haste. Send that at Teferi. Data X Collector, thank you very much for following. Oh yeah, basic uh, swamp. Like, this card is super threatening. I'm hoping that my opponent has to spin their wheels. I'm pro blue. So, I don't think that does what you want it to do. Borrower is a problem. Another shifting Ceratops would be sick. Alright, opponent does have Hall Breacher, which means we can't do the thing off Sylvan Library. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll say no to that. Alright, now the game of Do I Attack? I attack my opponent goes to 11. And my opponent can't block these shifting ceratops. The brazen borrower almost assuredly means my death. Not this turn, but the following turn. Which I think means that in order to win this game, I have to stay aggressive. Uh, this doesn't feel good. Actually, I know Tireless Tracker is on top. So I guess I'm going to hope that my opponent attacks in with Hull Breacher. I trade my Tireless Tracker. Oh god, that Force of Will is my death. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, so Ceratops can get reach. However, like, if my opponent attacks in with three creatures and I block and kill one of them, take four, I go down to two. I think in the long run I end up losing that. I don't know. Maybe maybe since I knew about the second tireless tracker, my line was wrong. So now I'm going to sit here with both of these creatures. I'm going to hope that my opponent sends in the entire team, not knowing that um, Shifting Ceratops can get reach. And then I kill both of these, turn Sylvan Library back on. And draw another Ceratops for lethal. My opponent has like any number of Monarch cards too that also might cripple me. Go to one. They just wanted to use Crucible more. Blue mages only want to do one thing, and it's disgusting. <clears throat> All right, uh, do I just attack with Tireless Tracker? And try to prompt the trade on Hull Breacher. If my opponent makes a secondary shark, I die anyway because I can only block one thing with reach. So probably. And then shifting Ceratops' trample becomes relevant the following turn. Send it. And I think I send without showing the Mana Gorger Hydra. I think I want them to make any decisions that they have to make before knowing that Mana Gorger Hydra is there. Awkwardly, this attack does leave me dead to a Force of Will. Yep. I was kind of operating under the assumption that my opponent might have, like, you know, a couple one-drops that I shut off. Yeah, and it's very possible, specifically because of the card Force of Will, I should have done it first. Yeah, I'll have to think about this spot a little bit more later. All right. So, as evidenced by that game, I don't think these sorts of cards are particularly good against my opponent. Like, they have Teferis to bounce it. Um, they have a decent number of cards at higher converted mana costs that they can just cast and play magic with. We had that Chalice in play for most of the game, and it did not really do anything. So I'm probably going to cut most or all of this stuff. We'll play just as many cards that have relevant text as we can. Play one Trinosphere for good luck. Or one Chalice for good luck. You want Chalice for good luck.
Well, Carbon Flowers is great, but it's not this good. Uh, let's ship this one. Um, God, that's awkward. I don't know that I can keep this one. At the same time, this is like literally everything that I need to win a game as long as my opponent puts one island into play. My opponent should force of will this if they have the opportunity to force of will this. This card is just absolutely disgusting. Will hopefully let me Sylvan Library next turn, and then I dig myself out of this. If my opponent just plays fetches and passes for a couple of turns, things are a little awkward for me. So that ate a force of will. That's okay. My opponent will have to can trip eventually, right? That's how that works. And then as soon as they can trip, I maybe have hasty. Dinos, even. That's the dream. Hit for five, hit for ten, dead. Just tap out for a three drop. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, I guess it's not so much a swiping motion. Like, this is a Triceratops. Like, we got to be doing some sort of headbutt type thing. That's damn it. I do think the opponent is playing a bit of a dangerous game by not wastelanding me when I, like, pretty clearly am stuck on mana. Maybe they just have like a brazen borrower or something. And they just want to start clocking me. I'll reach her. Let's see. That's reasonable. See if my opponent just has the combo here and I just lose. Because if they play Days Undoing and like they get to draw seven and I lose my hand and they get seven treasures, I don't come back from that. I have 14 hasty power in play. Well, not in play, in hand. If I were the opponent, I would be looking for Days Undoing, Counter Magic, and things like Swords to Plowshares that are efficient one-for-ones. Alright, that's annoying. I don't get to do anything about that.
Okay. So I will play first main phase Carpet of Flowers. And then I will move to second main phase, where I get mana. I have four mana. I'm going to go ahead and play one of my uncounterable Shifting Ceratops. Shifting Ceratops there plays a little bit around Force of Will and Force of Negation. There's a world where I just want to Oko and plus in the Hull Breacher in fear of Day's undoing. But if my opponent had that, they would have done it on their turn. Famous last words, of course, but you know. Stop bouncing my fucking carpet. <laughs> It is also just like super tilting that I'm not drawing a land here to be able to like just haste kill these in so many different ways. I don't know which card I'm supposed to play. Probably one of the four drops. I'll play one of the legendary ones here. That way if my opponent, like, answers it, it turns my second one into a live card. All right. Let's see if uh, Carpet of Flowers gets answered for the third turn in a row, or if I can uh, play a Shifting Ceratops. I think I want to play Questing Beast pre combat, try to kill Teferi that way, and then play Oko post combat. That gets a little weird if they randomly decide to use Wasteland finally. Maybe I do it the other way and I use Oko as the bait spell. Like, try to get them to respond to this and tap some mana, and then Questing Beast does the thing. Don't have Red Elemental Blast to punish me for the line that I'm about to do. Actually, maybe this Planeswalker doesn't matter anymore. Maybe I just, like, try to switch the control role and play Garrick. Turn is hard as hell. So they could just, like, Garrick and remove Hull Breacher. Have the Planeswalker in play that my opponent has to answer via Brazen Borrower.
I play Garak, it gets hit by Force of Negation hard cast here, which would be a little rough. Alright, so Questing Beast has the tax. Whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to target Planeswalker. They control, so I can just attack them directly. I'm not going to live in fear of Days Undoing. I'm going to try to advance my board. Like, I don't think my opponent has Days Undoing right now. If they find it, they find it. I think this game is actually going to be a race. So I think my opponent is... Potentially going to try to like bounce or remove my questing beast in some way this turn and then kill my Oko and then I'm going to play like hasty. Okay. Um. Do I beat that? No outs. The only way that I can beat this is using an Oko negative five to take a flyer and go all the way with it. Okay. So, I've got a plan. Or if you don't play Dino Stompy to have good deck building decisions, right? Like, you play it because you want to fucking play dinosaurs. The original version of this had um, Brazen Borrower in it, but I thought the top side of it was just going to be way too hard to cast. I'm going to kill this Hole Breacher so that something like Sylvan Library can be live later. Ah, uh, shit. <sighs> like, am I blocking and killing this and then hoping to take some other creature later? I think that has to be the plan. This is awful, though. My opponent says oops. No, it's not oops. It's actually fine for you. No, I think I need to probably keep this Oko alive. Like, I need to have an Oko with 7 loyalty in play. Or, well, at least 5 loyalty in play. And then they need to play a flyer, and I need to take it. Like, that's, that's how I win. 
And so it sucks that I have to kill one of their flyers, which is like what I want in order to win this. I also can't really mill them out now that they have a Court of Cunning in play. Well, that's going to accelerate quickly. Play Flyer. Sure, I have all the mana in the world from Carpet of Flowers, though. The Fairy Bouncing Moat, also an out. We are going to survive the winter by making a lot of food. I'm also going to start F6ing through my opponent's turn. If they destroy my food or something, like, so be it. I'm not expecting a hasty, hasty flying creature out of this deck. Whee! My cards! My precious library! In case you're not familiar with Court of Cunning, by the way, um, if my opponent is the Monarch, I mill 10 a turn. Uh, which is rough. Alright, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, scoop it up here. It doesn't look like my opponent is going to be casting any other cards this game. Womp, womp. Okay, I am on the play with a really awkward hand. So this hand can do a turn two chalice into Tarmogoyf, but it's not like that's exactly a combo. This doesn't have the mana to cast Oko, but with literally any land, this hand probably becomes good. I'm going to keep this. This is like B minus hand. Where like I am bordering on a mulligan. But I have a very strong turn to play and a ton of follow up. Oh god, is it dead guy ale? This swamp's pretty dope. Are we just gonna play against like all the videos I recommended to try out with your god accounts? We got the, the shark court deck last round, we get dead guy ale this round. I would be so on board with this. That Dead Guy Ale video is like going off though. I think it's at like 5.5k views right now. I'm so stoked. Now my best performing video of all time. The Sushi Loam deck might overtake it. I think I just played Tarmogoyf this turn off Basic Forest. This avoids a Wasteland if my opponent is playing Wasteland, and it allows me to hide information that Misty Rainforest is the card that I drew. However, if my opponent goes him to Turok and takes my blue source away and leaves me with Oko, it's awkward as hell. How big is this? This is a 3-4. Yeah, it's Dead Guy Ale! Are we the baddies? Are we the baddies? Yep. 
Yeah, so Dead Guy Ale usually does not have Aether Vials. It has a strong discard suite and features more black cards. Whereas um, Death and Taxes on a Black Splash is a white deck with some black. Dead Guy Ale is a deck that is like very, very, very black focused. I think I'm going to have to elk that Bob, too. What's the wording on this card? Rats, I have to discard. I can't just turn this into an elk for zero. There's a world where I am just supposed to plus two Oko there, but since I have another, I'm good with this. Ooh. All right, anyone who, who in chat who was ripping on Dead Guy Ale, we're getting fucking bullied. <laughs> we're so fucking dead. So we're taking three this turn, Oko's dying, and we're getting wastelanded, and my opponent is going to have a Planeswalker left in play. We're beyond dead. I'm voting for the opponent here. <laughs> um. Honestly, I didn't expect to lose that one once we stuck the Oko. Uh, that was a hell of a swing. A bunch of our cards are also not particularly potent versus Dead Guy Ale. Feel like, we probably have three cards we can reasonably sideboard in. Yeah, Baruch. I mean, that was kind of my experience playing Dead Guy Ale. Like, I played a bunch of cards, and as long as I did things and used my mana every turn, I wrecked people. Like, it's just attacking on enough slightly different axes just consistently enough that when it executes its game plan, it's, it's tough to beat. Um... I think stopping the batter skull from hitting play is kind of a big deal. Like, leaving that as a card in hand that gives them virtual card advantage is probably pretty good. I wasn't expecting to lose two creatures in a row. Um, but that's exactly what happened. Um, I think this hand is a little bit too slow. I don't have a, any plays until turn three, and I'm going to lose a bunch of cards by then. Uh, this hand is quite good. Well, not quite good. It's good enough. I think I pitch one spirit guide. Yes, kind of. That's a good way to put it. When Dead Guy Ale does its thing, it is rather difficult to beat. So hopefully our opponent has a hand that's one drop centric, because if they just drop a bob on this board... Ugh. They end up pretty far ahead. Johnny Terrell, thank you very much for following.
basic swamps. Um, Dark Confidant and Stoneforge Mystic are cards that are really important, but I think that protecting my stuff from something like Swords to Plowshares ends up being equally important. Because if I play, you know, a large dinosaur and my opponent answers it for one mana, I am, like, way, way, way out in terms of tempo. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. That's that's fine. Like if that name's ooze, I still trade with Dark Confidant if Dark Confidant attacks. And neither one of those things blocks Questing Beast. This is slightly awkward, but I don't want to do this actually. It might be better to play Mox Diamond so that I can have green green in the future. Mm, this is awkward. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. All right, Questing Beast plus Bob. And now we hope that the opponent doesn't know that Questing Beast is legendary. Nice. That's nice. Is my opponent just going to amp him this immediately? Because otherwise, if they make a token, I just attack in and kill Gideon. Unless they plus one. This is actually a very awkward play for my opponent. I wonder if they're realizing that now. Okay, so now Questing Beast is blockable by these creatures. I mean, DNT is historically the rug killer, so like that's that's not surprising. I would be happy to trade Questing Beast for mana or for Plague Engineer. I'm going to go ahead and attack in. Okay, nice. Very happy, because that's a Karakasable threat that I can't recast. I think I will go ahead and deploy Ye Old Mana Gorger Hydra, because that offers as insurance from a Liliana. And if I can keep this Scavenging Ooze around, it now has two things in Graveyard to eat. Stoneforge is great for my opponent. Very, very good here. What to do? 
what to do. I don't think I'm gonna be quite aggressive enough to get through all of this, but I might just like outgrow a batter skull. Either with the scavenging goose or with the mana gorger hydra. I can't forget about my opponent's Gideon emblem. I theoretically need something larger than a 4 4. Two creatures in graveyards. Gavin and Ooze can become a 4 4 this turn, or I can play the other Mana Gorger Hydra. But I think this Mana Gorger Hydra is the thing that eventually beats the Batter Skull. And so. I go ahead and play this, which turns this into a 3 3. Now, this can attack, and if this trades with Bob, I'm good with that because it puts a bunch of stuff in graveyard. And then over two turns, my current scavenging ooze can become bigger than Batter Skull. All oh, right, this needs to be two because Gideon Emblem. All right, four creatures in graveyard. While the battle skull is not necessarily handled, I now have an active line towards beating it. I will probably eat at some point on my turn. All right, my opponent is opting to just discard. I'll play this out because of him to Turok. And on the off, off chance that my opponent is playing some Delve card, I'm going to go ahead and just eat these now. Again, I don't think that's likely. But it would be... So utterly brutal for me if that was actually the case. <laughs> Hello, Arkin. It's Dino Stompy featuring Oko versus Dead Guy Ale. Uh, classic legacy match. Yeah, Kez, that's a great example. Something like a murderous cut. Which I think its days have gone and passed. But you never know. Hey, every once in a while, I get paired against, like, a Tomb Stalker or a Gurmag Angler or something still. Oh, no. Oh, no. I assume this is being pointed at Scavenging Ooze. Yep. All right. So, Mana Gorger Hydra can mm, probably outgrow this germ eventually. Uh, opponent... Making a good attack here by also getting in there with the Stone Forge. I can't block that. This thing is just going to be a 3 4 lifelinker, just throwing that out there. 
that thing picking up a batter skull like as this game goes really late is going to be disgusting. I expect this is just casting Murderous Rider. We'll see, though. Oh, no. I think my opponent probably could have gotten away with attacking first. I understand not wanting to take the chance. Oh, God. The bad news bears. I think this is probably the point where I hit concede if I don't have just a fire draw. Yeah, like I get hit for seven this turn cycle, which is half my life total. My opponent could have active Jitte or another threat in play. I'm dead. I got dead guy ailed. Like I, I had a real chance in that game, but like they they had removal spells. They were able to play relatively well around the chalice and they took over the game as it went long. I thought the ooze was going to get there. Then I thought the Mana Gorger Hydra was going to get there. Wrong! Final round. Let's see if we can come out ahead with this deck. I believe that I will be keeping this hand. I have the possibility of a turn one Chalice of the Void, um, which I likely will be doing. And then I have some powerful threats later. But if my opponent is playing the Dark Depths deck that I suspect they are playing... We just don't have a good matchup, and I probably lose this one. Yeah, there's uh, there's two kinds of white cards that have been printed recently. Unplayable ones, and ones that got banned. <laughs> and there's very little in between. Like, Loris and Zerda were absolutely insane. For example, like, those were just, like, absolute top-tier white cards. And outside of those in the past year, Skyclave Apparition is really the only white card that comes to mind. Which is great. I love the living hell out of that card. Like, Luminarch Aspirant is good, but not, like, on the same level as, as the shit like Underworld Breach, Oko Arrow. It's not quite there. It's just a good card. Okay, well, we resolved the Chalice on one against a deck that led on Ponder. It's a good start. Turn three Oko is problematic. But at least I'll have a threat in play. Do I do this? Do I play Mox Diamond? I really don't want my mana to get elked. Well, I'm already going to fetch to put... Oh, I, I see what you're saying. I think I'm going to save the Mox Diamond for at least one turn, because if I draw another land the next turn, I can, like, go land into Mox Diamond and to cast a Shifting Ceratops. 
But there is a world where I just play Mox Diamond without, uh... Brazen Borrower? Oh, Hull Breacher off Spirit Guide. Unexpected. <clears throat> Are we playing against the Breach and Show deck? Two three, two three. The Breach and Show deck has Show and Tell, Sneak Attack, Hull Breacher, and Days Undoing. SCK, what I would recommend is that you start acquiring the pieces that go in both and proxy up both, try both, see what decision you feel like makes sense to you. So we got a zero mana, plus one, plus one counter on Mana Gorgia, plus Tarmond Wife. Um, who's the beatdown? Am I the beatdown? Are you the beatdown? It's really hard to tell right now. I think I'm just gonna chill and hope that I kill my opponent via shifting Ceratops later. It's possible Tarmogoyf should attack, but then I get attacked back for six. If my opponent just, like, plays a day's undoing, the waiting favors them, but otherwise I'm pretty good here. Second Chalice on one. Because if I draw another land, I want to play a Ceratops. So I think I will go ahead and do that. It's already an artifact in the graveyard, so I don't need to just, like, kill another. Why the beat down now? No. Let's just wait. I could be the beatdown now and attack with both, and then my opponent can't kill both of them. But if I wait to so say that Mana Gorge or Hydra has to be double blocked... Oh god, this is exactly, exactly what I want. Beautiful. Now I'm the beatdown. Can't be countered. Is hasty. Send them. Dinosaur noises intensify. The opponent's not quite dead on board next turn. But I have a lot of trample damage that, like, Hull Breacher is not going to be good against. Also, like, lol, 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 lol. This is, this is what I came here to do. Ask Shifting Ceratops, give it haste. Uh, we also would have played a Chalice of, Void, for, of the Void on zero to give Mana Gorger Hydra one more additional counter. <clears throat> All 
All right. Is opponent actually a sneak and show deck? Or are they just one of the multiple mid-range decks that just happens to play Hull Breacher? Don't really have enough information since I challenged them so early. I'm going to be bringing in Carpet and maybe Garrick and definitely my own Hull Breacher. If they are a combo deck... Yeah, they had Simeon Spirit Guide. Which makes me... kind of think that they're gonna be the deck that I played. Like, Trinisphere is kind of weak against that on the draw anyway. Uh, Silver Fist, I don't know the actual answer to that question, but I bet if you tag them on Twitter, they can put you into a, like, meaningful way of interacting with that. Without knowing what other, like, portions... How do I say this? Without knowing for sure what other things my opponent is doing, it's a little bit harder to know how to arrange my deck. I think hedging that they still might be some sort of sneak and show deck. I'm going to bring in the thorns, and then when I'm on the play, hopefully, well, hopefully I just win this game. But if we go to a game three, the Trinisphere's probably come back in when I'm on the play. So, in my experience, when I played the, like, Sneak and Breach deck, the trying to assemble multiple different A plus B combo decks often meant that you ended up with, like, a Show and Tell and a Hull Breacher or a Days Undoing and a Sneak Attack, and it wasn't, like, hyper consistent at executing its game plan, and I wasn't super impressed with the deck. Um, this hand is very fair. Chalice was good last time. Is this hand good enough? Like, can I keep a hand with no acceleration when I'm not 100% sure what my opponent is doing? <sighs> if my opponent is actually playing a fair blue deck and not combo, this hand is stellar. And if they are playing a combo deck, this hand is eh. I'm gonna keep it. I have seen some weird things from some of these Hull Breacher Days Undoing decks that I didn't expect. Like, when you are playing 3-drop Tribal, playing, like, a Spirit Guide or two so that you can get ahead on tempo from your other opponents is not crazy. Yeah, and then your opponent plays Mentor on turn two, and you're like, oh, fuck.
yeah, like, in a world where games are dominated by a single snowballing card, if you play your single snowballing card before your opponent does, you win more of those games, right? So, a fair piece of non-traditional mana acceleration is not crazy in those worlds. Yeah, Headshot Catcher, that's, that's a great example. Like, you play a Dreadhorde Arcanist on turn one, you have a counterspell to protect it, like, what on earth is your opponent going to do? And this is part of the reason why Carpet of Flowers is one of the best cards in Legacy right now. When you deploy your haymakers ahead of your opponent, or when you deploy more haymakers than your opponent, like, you just win. I have won a large number of games to being able to, like, pay for a card around days off of Simeon Spirit Guide. <sighs> All right. I think I'm going to fetch basics this game. I don't want to randomly lose to a Blood Moon or back to basics from my opponent. Like, my opponent fetched Volcanic Island on turn one, so I don't think that's likely to happen. But it's pretty free, especially since I've sideboarded out two of the three scavenging oozes. If my opponent casts a show and tell, a braid off Simeon Spirit Guide. Okay, that's fine. If my opponent casts a show and tell and just puts in like an Amra Cool, I can theoretically elk that and win. Do I hide the Oko, or do I play the Oko? This is a 3-4 Tarmon Earth right now, so next turn it attacks for just as much as the Oko would. I'm going to go ahead and play this Oko. Hiding this information is worth something, but over time this Oko is worth more damage in play. And if I just trade this one for one with a Force of Negation and have a follow-up afterwards, that's really good for me. Playing the Tarmogoyf would play around days, though. That's super interesting that my opponent chose to return the land. That shows me that they probably have Hullbreacher. Okay, that's fine. All right, lots of ways to play this turn. I want to do the highest upside play. The highest upside play is Tracker followed by Misty afterwards. The safest play is just shifting Ceratops pass. The most conservative play is probably Tarmogoyf. 
into hasty ceratops next turn. I don't think I want to show the second Oko in case my opponent is playing show and tell. So if I'm not going to show that, what do I want to do? I think play Tarmoglyph this turn into hasty ceratops next turn. Okay, so I think this confirms that we are playing against the Sneak and Show version. Go ahead and fetch to Thin. We are not really playing Cantrips. Sylvan Library doesn't look great in the face of Hull Breacher. Um, do I want to take damage to Ancient Tomb this turn? I might so that I can save Misty Rainforest for Tireless Tracker. Welcome, glad you could make it to a live session. I could use my mana hyper efficiently this turn and like use all six mana and double spell by playing Tracker plus Oko. But it feels like just getting my opponent dead is better. I'm going to save the Misty Rainforest for Tracker. Uh, this life is maybe relevant in some cases. I'm not going to do that. I don't think the cards are relevant. I think this game ends in two-ish turn cycles one way or another. I'm not super worried about Days Undoing anymore, because my opponent, if my opponent casts Days Undoing and that's their turn, they're still facing down 9 power. Okay, so what my opponent did is pretty similar to what my experience was playing that Sneak and Breach deck, where you oftentimes end up with the wrong pieces and you can't quite string everything together and i i flopped around and died a lot when i played that deck so i'm not super surprised to see my opponent do the same thing um, i do think their draws were below average though and i don't think they had like too much to say about that okay uh overall what are my thoughts on the deck not bad um, we're a little light on interaction, but that's always kind of been one of the weaknesses of Dino Stompy. So, like, if you're playing Dino Stompy, you're playing it because a pro-blue, uncounterable, main deck, like, Reality Smasher style card is pretty good. And you, like, also think that the Chalice Trinisphere stuff, along with relatively efficient threats that can be played off of Soul Lands, are good. Was the Oko Splash worth it? A little bit hard to say. The, the card definitely did things in a few games, and it gave us theoretical outs to a lot of stuff. Since we moved most of the blue stuff either out of the deck or to the sideboard, and it was a splash mostly for one very powerful card, it felt justifiable. Whereas here, when we were really pushing the mana with red cards that we wanted early, plus like having important green green cards as well. Um, it felt a little bit clunkier. This deck also tried to get away with Wasteland, which the Dino Stompy deck is not trying to do. 
As far as the sideboard goes, the stuff that I had access to was nice. I might want a couple more Hull Breachers. Like, maybe Hull Breachers better than Thorn of Amethyst. Like, we brought Hull Breacher in to just kind of fill gaps when our colorless cards weren't particularly good. Oh, let me drag this over a little bit more. Um, I also theoretically want an answer to an enchantment. Uh, the original list had Brazen Borrower, which I cut because I was afraid of the blue-blue cost just, like, not being castable. But then we didn't have an answer to a resolved moat, which, like, maybe that's one of those things where you're like, eh, okay. Or maybe you need to toss in a one of Brazen Bower or Rex Sage or something of that nature. Um, overall, I, I liked the tools that I had access to. It was a fun deck. Is it one of the most competitive things in the world? No. But does it have a bunch of Carpet of Flowers and powerful cards? Yes. BMC Grout Wilt is a fantastic suggestion. Thank you for that one. All right, uh, YouTube folks, let me know in the comments if you have any ideas for tweaking this deck list. I'm, I know the uh, the donor is a regular YouTube person, uh, and Lucas B will probably check out your comments. And if you're really enjoying the content, please consider, you know, like, subscribing, or maybe even doing a donation deck list of your own. Info is below the stream, or below the video in the description.